She didn't push a button. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Welcome aboard. We're going to begin now. Okay. I just figured everything out now. Okay. <laughs> well, welcome everyone to uh, the uh, neuroendocrinology course, uh, Bio 5453. Uh, I'll be taking you through the syllabus today uh, and uh, the WebCT course site to explain how it will uh, function and help you understand how to utilize it, especially if you haven't utilized it before. Uh, in addition, uh, we might have a bit of time to uh, have an introductory lecture that I typically start with in this course. <clears throat> uh, first, I'll uh, switch over to the document camera just to show you the textbook quickly and make a note uh, about uh, the uh, structure of the textbook. It is an introduction to neuroendocrinology and the reason that I use this textbook in this course is that typically students uh, taking this course haven't had very much uh, neuroendocrinology as an undergraduate, may have had some in, a, in an, uh, either an endocrinology course or a general physiology course, uh, but not a, a, a real focus on the full spectrum uh, of the uh, <clears throat> biological implications and functions, the broad functions of the uh, neuroendocrine system. Therefore, the objective of the course is uh, to start at the introductory level. We go through the uh, introductory textbook and then quickly wean off that and go to the, the literature and then the remaining part of the uh, semester is all from uh, the literature. I haven't taught the course in a while, so most of that literature is uh, um, maybe five, six years uh, uh, short, let's say, so I haven't caught up on it. And what I hope to be able to do is to find a few uh, more recent articles. I haven't created any assignments for the course, but I may send emails to people to go looking for uh, a relevant neuroendocrinology uh, uh, research article and let me know where it is, and then we'll include it in the uh, class presentations and discussions. Before switching away from the textbook, I just want to show you the uh, end of the, the chapters. Uh, there's a lot of used textbooks, uh, a lot more affordable, I guess. And uh, I guess the prior students have uh, used them quite extensively. At the end of each chapter, there are review questions. as you see here, and then uh, essay questions. So uh, upon approaching a, a scheduled exam, I noticed this student didn't uh, circle the ones that I had uh, assigned for the exam, I will send an email to you through the WebCT course uh, and uh, indicating which ones you need to be able to answer and uh, know about, uh, such as the essay questions, uh, and, and be able to answer in, in some contextual way conceptual way uh, to be prepared for the exam. So I'll switch from that uh, to the computer and put up the, uh, the syllabus and we'll go from there. The syllabus is posted at the WebCT site. Uh, <clears throat> I better take this up another notch or two here. Let's try 200, that's too much. Maybe 180. Oh, it doesn't let you. I take a pre. So you may not be able to read this, but the well, you can read it here in class. But the scan converter for the streaming video, well, and then it ends up teeny tiny, so you can't read it on there. But I'll I'll explain how we can work with that for the streaming video as we go along. Uh, what you notice is there's uh, just the one uh, textbook, and this semester we have the face to face here at 1604. Uh, with a distance learning link to downtown, and then there is a, a third section that, uh, that's completely online. Uh, <clears throat> the textbook is the Introduction to Neuroendocrinology, as I just showed. 
Um, and uh, our objective is to gain an in-depth knowledge of mammalian neuroendocrine systems. So as I said, we start with the introductory uh, level, which is the upper division undergraduate. Uh, we go through it at a pretty good pace. Uh, then we talk about some of the methodologies used in neuroendocrinology. And then we shift to look at each of the neuroendocrine axes, as they're called, uh, because the part of the brain, the hypothalamus, and then the pituitary, and then other uh, tissues or glands are involved, so we have more than one point along the uh, path of communication, so it's called an axis. Uh, so uh, we'll look at a few of these in great detail and end up focusing uh, in the greatest detail on the, uh, the mammalian reproductive uh, neuroendocrinology system because it is uh, so uh, elusive, evasive, uh, and filled with mysteries, and a lot has yet to be discovered uh, about exactly how all the molecular mechanisms work. So in essence, this is a molecular neuroendocrinology course. Now, we'll spend a lot of time talking about uh, genes and, and uh, gene regulation because this is one of the primary mechanisms by which the neuroendocrine hormones work. <coughs> As well, of course, we'll talk about intracellular communication systems because uh, that's the way that uh, the target cells of the hormones are uh, impacted to respond to the hormonal stimulus. So uh, there is quite a bit of molecular biology in this course give you everything you need. It isn't the most advanced course in molecular, uh, endo, uh, molecular biology, cellular biology. You won't leave here an expert, but you will have a better handle on understanding how uh, neuroendocrinology is studied and uh, how the neuroendocrine systems function at the molecular and cellular levels. There is a note in here for the online section basically saying that everything for this course is going to be uh, administered and available through the WebCT site, and I'll take you there in just a moment and demonstrate how to utilize uh, the features that are available there. This means uh, that the, uh, all the, the lecture slides will be posted there as PowerPoint, Adobe PDF with one slide per page or six slides per page, uh, and uh, you can utilize those in a, a variety of ways. Uh, I'll show you how you can open simultaneously the streaming video window and the PowerPoint or Adobe slide uh, file and follow along on your screen or print out uh, any one of those. The uh, Adobe, uh, one of the Adobe files is in the handout format from PowerPoint where it's six slides per page. So if you don't want to use so many pieces of paper to print them out and then you've got it there to scratch notes and stuff as you're watching the streaming video. And you can read even the six uh, slides per page. You can read better than uh, the little window in Real Player uh, with the streaming video. So everything is going to be there, as I said, uh, including the exams. So uh, I'll show you when we get onto the WebCT site how the exams are administered. I don't have a sample exam there uh, right now, but I'll take you to one of my other course sites to show you how that works. Uh, everything will be done that way. Uh, the exams will be, or the tests as I call them in this class, uh, will be multiple choice and uh, fill in the blank. Very few short answer. <clears throat> uh, and the WebCT uh, software grades them uh, automatically and instantly. When you finish, you submit it and uh, and have it graded, and then you can immediately go and look at your grade. It'll be posted and, and things like that. So it's just a fantastic system. I, I absolutely uh, love it, and I think you will as well. There's uh, methods for communication in there uh, that work uh, very efficiently, and so uh, we'll do all of our communication through there. Let me uh, continue through the topics that we'll talk about, and then we'll do some of the mechanics of the, of the course. So you can see that I uh, have the syllabus set up uh, with day, topic, and then the chapter uh, from the textbook, uh, the uh, lecture and review. It's introductory lecture and review are the first two days. So what I did was uh, 
on the August 24th and 26th for the introduction uh, in gene expression regulation, and then uh, have multiple days per line uh, for each of these. And the reason for this is I'd like to pace it so that I get uh, a reasonable uh, amount of information in each lecture so that the streaming video file isn't, you know, 20 hours long. It's uh, uh, 30 to 40 uh, minutes or maybe the full 50 minutes and then uh, it'll be available for view and review uh, at any time. So we are going to begin uh, actually with the uh, document uh, overhead mechanism where I displayed the textbook. Not right now, but uh, in a moment. I'm just uh, arranging it there. Uh, typically I did this at the chalkboard, but for here we'll uh, do it there and it'll be recorded as streaming video to illustrate the cell uh, and uh, begin talking about all the subcellular organelles and then get down to the level of the gene, talk about gene structure and uh, uh, the transcription, translation, post-translational processing, so protein production, very important obviously in endocrinology. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about how gene expression is regulated. Um, more so the latter portion of what I just stated uh, we'll talk about on Friday. We'll focus today mostly on, at the end of this lecture, mostly on the structure uh, of the cell and how that relates to uh, gene excuse me, uh, protein production. Then we'll go through uh, the textbook, the different chapters, one, two, three, four, all the way through, uh, and they're listed for each uh, of the lectures. We don't go through them in sequence because I prefer to cover the information in a slightly different order than the authors, but that's not a real problem. It's all available there uh, on the, uh, the syllabus. So we'll talk about the endocrine glands and hormones in general. And the endocrine system in general, then we'll begin talking about the hypothalamus and the pituitary portal system, the, the pituitary gland, uh, and then that will be sufficient uh, to have the first test. As I said, I'll tell you which uh, review uh, questions to look at at the end of the chapters uh, and uh, the ones for the essay questions. Uh, then we'll switch over to neuropeptides 1 and 2, looking at molecular neuroendocrinology. Um, and then neuroendocrine regulation from the perspective of neurotransmitters, and then cellular neuroendocrinology. So a lot of this information you may have uh, studied in general or in detail in other classes. That's fine if it's review. It's uh, fantastic. What we're going to do is mold it together into a picture uh, of uh, endocrinology and how the uh, experts in the field of neuroendocrinology and endocrinology uh, think of this and incorporate it uh, into textbooks, uh, then uh, we'll uh, ultimately, as I said, get to research articles and somewhere along the line here I might pop in with a research article just to emphasize how uh, this uh, particular aspect of neuroendocrinology uh, is investigated and reported. And uh, with that in mind, you can see the additional topics that we'll be uh, covering. <clears throat> what we want to do in this course is start with introductory textbook, primarily because I don't expect people to come in with a, a strong background uh, in this area. Uh, if you do, well, then it should be smooth sailing uh, and an easy task. Then we want to emphasize uh, how new information gets into textbooks. So we begin to look at review articles and the primary publications uh, in the literature. So uh, I haven't been able to find even yet uh, a molecular neuroendocrinology textbook that has all of this information. So I decided to structure this course so that we gain that appreciation. Here's an introductory neuroendocrinology textbook. Uh, we'll look at some review articles and primary literature and then that reinforces in our mind that this is the way that we generate new knowledge. There's questions. Uh, that are left unanswered about neuroendocrinology. Some scientist out there uh, formulates an hypothesis, does experiments, writes the primary report. Ultimately, somebody gets the urge to piece it together into a bigger picture, writes a review article, and then ultimately somebody sits down and updates a textbook or writes a textbook. And actually, this is a relatively new 
um, textbook. There, there hadn't been a, a really good introductory neuroendocrinology textbook in quite a while. I was uh, constantly looking, and a, a fellow uh, faculty member uh, somehow was selected to review this and brought it to my attention because they knew I taught the class, and I've been using it uh, ever since. So I think it's a good approach, and I don't have any intention in, in changing it for a long time. Uh, because a graduate level course should end up taking you to the level of focus on the primary literature. So when we get down to the more detailed descriptions, we start weaning off the uh, chapters of the textbook to the WebCT course site, where what I have done is I've posted files, and uh, we'll get them uh, uh, drawn to your attention a bit later uh, in the semester as we approach this level of study, is uh, I've copied and pasted uh, several uh, um, research article titles, and the author's names, and the source, and their abstracts into one single um, MS Word document file that's posted. And that will become our textbook. So what you will be doing at that point to help understand and anticipate what we'll be covering in the lecture, the PowerPoint slide presentation, uh, and then some of the papers are selected to be presented as papers by me, uh, is you'll be reading these uh, abstracts basically as your textbook and extrapolating from an abstract enough information uh, to see what, how we've incorporated that into our lecture on the topic. There's no way we could read all those articles uh, in this class, uh, but what we will see is that you, in just looking at the abstracts from many articles, we can piece together our own more advanced or intermediate level neuroendocrinology textbook. So it is definitely uh, a graduate level course uh, and demanding in that sense. So you've seen the tests and the test dates uh, flashing by. Note here, uh, test four, uh, November 21st to 30th. That's the longest time you'll see one uh, posted. The others are, are posted for slightly shorter periods of time, October 28th to 31st. So it'll be posted on WebCT for three or four days uh, and you'll have some time uh, to get to it. You won't take any exam in class. We'll just be lecturing every day. Uh, and uh, you'll take the uh, exams on your own time at any location on any computer uh, logging onto WebCT. So it's the five tests equal contribution to your grade. Each one uh, is 20% uh, of your overall grade. A couple of other texts that I've used uh, to put together uh, the ideas and the conceptual approach that I take, uh, Neuroendocrinology by Nemiroff. This is the one that I started with originally, and it was just uh, far too comprehensive and advanced and really focused, narrow in its focus uh, on some of the research topics. But I still use some information from that. And then this is a mammalian neuroendocrinology uh, that uh, uh, had some interesting uh, ways of presenting the topics but uh, it was more zoological from my perspective. I'm more uh, human uh, and clinical oriented, uh, so I tended not to uh, go in this direction. And it also was uh, uh, not as inclusive of molecular neuroendocrinology as the text we have for the class. So those are likely to be in the library if you just want to uh, do a little bit of additional reading and checking up on things. But I'm sure there'll be enough to keep you busy. So I, I'm going to assume that not everyone has uh, taken a course on WebCT, and I'll take you from the www.utsa.edu uh, website through the quick links to the WebCT. Otherwise, you can get to this location uh, just by uh, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash you know, uh, webct.utsa.edu will take you right to this site if you don't want to go through the UTSA website. But if you're on campus, you open Explorer, it automatically takes you uh, there or to UTSA today and you just uh, click on this little location here and it takes you right to the, uh, the page we were at previously. <clears throat> so I'm just going to secure my logon by not letting you see me do it. 
And you will find when you get to this page all the instructions uh, to log on, so read it over. Uh, you uh, can click right on that site. <coughs> Actually, let me go to it. Another page here. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you can click right here for instructions to log on if you haven't logged on before. Once you log in, every course you're taking that is posted on WebCT will be listed there. And I'll show you that how that is uh, for me. As Logging in as the instructor, I have uh, courses under development and all three of mine for the semester. So you'll see all of that when you are logged in as well. All three of our sections uh, are included in this one link to Bio 5453 that are under Chronology. And so you can see various icons on here. Uh, the calendar, I'll take you there first. So uh, each exam when it is going to become available and uh, the extent of days that it will be available is posted there. So uh, no excuses uh, for missing it, I guess. But I'll show you uh, the, the communication tools in, in just a moment uh, for that. Actually, let's go to that first. So under communication tools, I'm going to leave these active. Uh, the only one we'll use is the private mail uh, for you to send emails to me. You click on compose message here. And when you do that uh, and go to this browse, the list of everybody in the class is there. You can send it to one person or uh, just click and hold and select everybody and send it to everybody in the class. Feel free to communicate with each other. If you uh, want to have kind of study groups or whatever, uh, you're more than welcome to start chat room uh, activities. Uh, there's a general chat just for this class. Uh, these are other rooms that are, I guess, for everybody that's on WebCT. I haven't played with them very much, but yeah, we'll just say yes one time. <clears throat> so you're, you're obviously welcome to uh, investigate these. Whiteboard thing is kind of cool, too. I haven't figured out exactly how to use it yet. I don't know if it's interactive for everybody to see it or if it's just for you when you have it on the window. Uh, <clears throat> but as I said, only the private mail is what we'll use. So if you have any need to correspond with me through email about this course, do it here. If you send it to uh, my at utsa.edu uh, email address, don't expect a reply because uh, I don't use that for the courses. Now, I, I may get a chance to or I may not to. I may not get a chance to there. What I do commit to is that at least each morning I'll log on to my WebCT and I'll check for mail on all my classes and try to respond to everyone uh, that morning. And then I try to log on uh, other times. I lecture every afternoon. So uh, from this location, I'll be checking and uh, be able to reply there as well. <coughs> I guess in that context, then I should come back to the syllabus and do talk about the office hours. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, we'll arrange any office hour needs uh, through the WebCT mailbox or here in, here in class uh, at, you know, at the webct.utsa.edu. Uh, you can leave me voicemail messages at my office uh, uh, number, 458-5498. My at utsa.edu email address is clyde.felix at utsa.edu. If you feel it's urgent to get a message to me for whatever reason, uh, you can use the WebCT and voicemail and my other email. <clears throat> uh, but that isn't really a major concern because if you communicate through the WebCT uh, mailbox with me, um, you know I'm not going to be in town. I got to go to a meeting or I'm sick or whatever it is. You communicate there. Uh, the nice thing is that WebCT has this tremendous flexibility. Uh, for scheduling and rescheduling, individualizing things. So it's completely flexible, and every student I work with absolutely loves it. Uh, uh, for some of the undergraduate courses, there are athletes in there, and when they have a game that conflicts, 
they just tell me when they're going to be uh, able to get to a computer and then I'll schedule the exam for that time and uh, give them time to do it and then they take it from wherever they are. So <clears throat> um, there's no need to really to fret over anything. We have plenty of time. We can solve everything uh, as we go along the way. Back to the home page here. Uh, you saw me just navigating uh, along this line up here uh, the, under the course materials. <clears throat> The course syllabus is posted here. Uh, the lecture files, I don't have ours up there yet, but I'll get them uh, to there. I just borrowed a couple from another course uh, in, in, uh, to demonstrate, as I will now, how to uh, load a lecture. This is in the PDF format, so it's coming up in the Adobe file. So I can open that one. I'll just minimize that for a moment. Uh, minimize. And then I can come back to um, the home page, go to the streaming video lecture. I borrowed the streaming video from uh, the general physiology course that I teach. Started. <coughs> so you can have the small uh, window for the people brought it to my attention that the supplemental lectures uh, were not loading. I just uh, uh, that up that neurons forward. Uh, really are pause find the slide that's on uh, specialized secretory cells depending upon your transition computer monitor and everything of the endocrine system and then transition to the this. nervous system really is a, a logical one because we're just focusing on secretory cells neurons are specialized secretory cells where they have uh, the excitable membranes so for the neuroendocrine you system, print these out in PDF, then, uh, and we have you can write even further notes. specialization uh, depending of, upon the computer uh, you're working on. The brain cells, uh, the neurons, the as connection uh, with secretory cells, to, to where they're it. going to secrete uh, into the interstitial fluid close to a, a capillary bed. We said any lab, endocrine so tissue or endocrine organs, organ uh, uh, is going to have a rich capillary bed. bed. Any histology slide we've looked at so anywhere, far, I'd try to point out just. Back it up and play it again, you know. Uh, using quantitative methods to evaluate uh, feedback loops. This is the way that uh, I envision everyone using it. I think it's a very efficient way of doing it. What I'm going to do now is go back to my web CT. I think I showed you everything here. Oh, here's the uh, assessment tools. And uh, I think on yours I only have the quiz and tests activated. So this will be the only icon that you will see. And when the tests are uh, posted, they'll be listed there. And I'll show you that on one of my other uh, websites uh, in just a moment. And then under student profile, here it is. You can check your grades. I don't know what this tracking record does or the student home pages right now, but left it up there. So when the time comes, you'll be able to click there. For me, it only shows a Moby Dick essay. I can assure you, you're not going to have to write a Moby Dick essay in this class. Uh, <clears throat> but it'll, it'll show all the exams. And then when you finish an exam, um, you'll be able to look at the results uh, through the feature after you've finished taking the exam, the stats on the questions, all kinds of interesting things like that. Uh, and then you'll be able to come here and see your grades uh, listed uh, all the time. So I'm going to go back to my web CT and go to my Gen Phys course uh, and uh, show you uh, how the exams work there. So in this course they have exercises, exams, case studies, and quizzes. Uh, at present we're just going to have the tests, the five tests uh, that you've seen in, in the course. Uh, so they're scheduled for a number of days that's uh, on the calendar on our website. I'm just going to go in and preview an exam to show you how that uh, they will work. You can see that they're, they're multiple choice. You can navigate uh, from question to question here. Typically what I do is um, I only allow one question to come up at a time, but you can go uh, to any question at any time. <clears throat> Uh, when you answer them, uh, after you've answered, here you can see a short answer on a graph. 
and ask you the question, based on the data shown in the graph, which term describes the interactive effect of glucagon and epinephrine uh, and cortisol potentiated, additive, or synergistic? For an undergraduate course, I would give them the terms. Uh, for you, you would have to put it in. It's kind of frustrating because if you don't put it in exactly how I have the software keyed to grade it, then uh, you'll get it wrong. But you just send me an email, ask me to go take a look at it, and I take a look at it, and I can override it and give you the full credit and stuff like that. So it has that complete flexibility to negotiate grades, discuss uh, things. You can send emails to each other, include me on it to discuss openly uh, any of the questions that, that you uh, see. Uh, what I don't do is once you finish the exam, you don't get to see the questions. Uh, and you, you're not allowed to print them out uh, or any other type of uh, computer magicry uh, to, uh, to get them. <clears throat> uh, you can ask me about them uh, through the email, discuss them uh, openly. I think that's a, a good way to uh, stimulate uh, the group activities. So you can see there's going to be plenty of figures uh, in each exam with interpretive type of questions, predictive type of questions, uh, um, and a variety of things like that. If you are going to work uh, on a uh, camera's not focusing. <clears throat> if you're going to work off a, a phone line, you might have troubles loading some of the exams uh, with the number of figures that will be there. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, to try to find a site with a you know, very high speed, high volume uh, internet connection. Uh, to be able to do that. So as I said, once you uh, would answer them, you would save the answer. It won't let me do it because I'm just in preview as the instructor. When you have saved the answer, it'll uh, change this uh, um, yellow circle over here to uh, a check mark uh, that it's been answered. A uh, little uh, exclamation point in a box uh, if it's answered and not saved. So if you don't uh, complete all this, when you reach the bottom, and click finish. Of course, it won't let me do it, but what it does when you click finish, it prompts you whether you want to uh, submit it and have it graded, and of course you'll want to say yes, uh, submit and grade it. Uh, you'll have uh, the, the same amount of time as you would in the classroom, 50 minutes to complete the exam. They're all designed to be administered in a classroom, so you'll have the same amount of time uh, to do it uh, on the internet. Any problems come up, just send me emails. Uh, and uh, we'll work it out. You can see in this uh, particular undergraduate course, I give them uh, two chances to, to take the exam. When I was first doing this and developing these uh, in uh, lower level courses, uh, I give five chances and people would just keep taking the exam. However many times I <laughs> let them take it, they would take it. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, very likely, uh, at a graduate level, I'll give you one opportunity, and then you can let me know how that turns out. Oops. So again, uh, for the online section, uh, they'll be doing everything from this site. Uh, attendance is not required. Uh, I was explaining to some people earlier, I've uh, worked on developing courses like this with 50, 60 people here in a, uh, you know, five to ten downtown, and eventually <clears throat> there's one or two people or no people. But I come, I record the lectures. Uh, the group in the back is very good at uh, getting them posted within 24 hours, so there's just a one-day offset. It's entirely up to you. Uh, if you are completely comfortable uh, doing the course, through the WebCT site, 100%. Uh, it's entirely up to you. You know when I will be here. If you want to uh, come to see me face to face, either for a lecture or to ask questions or for an office visit out after class, uh, you're welcome to come and do that. So what I'm going to do now is switch over to the, the document camera here and uh, begin the lecture on the cell. Quite often in teaching this graduate level course, uh, I have students that ask me to serve on their uh, examination committees. Um, 
at the master's level, the comprehensive exam committees. Uh, too late now, but uh, uh, during your dissertation defense, maybe I'll, I'll have a chance to, to come after you. Uh, for the doctoral level students, um, uh, the written exam uh, is uh, generated uh, from by a group of faculty, the doctoral studies committee. I don't know if any of these questions uh, would uh, show up there, but certainly this is a level of expertise that you should have at uh, any level of graduate studies and to be able to uh, just grab a piece of paper and a pen and describe the cell, subcellular organelles, uh, and how they're put together and how they function in uh, the cellular activities, certainly protein synthesis and how that relates to the uh, biosynthesis and degradation of any other uh, biological macromolecules and uh, be able to uh, draw higher magnification and higher magnification levels right down to the molecular level even uh, to explain this information uh, whether you're teaching or just working in a research lab trying to share ideas and information. So I go through this each year uh, in this course uh, just to show that uh, uh, I still need to practice those skills myself every now and then. So the typical approach is to, to draw a composite cell, and it will be a cell that has a nucleus, so a eukaryotic cell, and I'm not getting a large nucleus here, because I'm used to doing this on a chalkboard. And of course, what you're uh, recognizing is that uh, there's double lines here with little circles as we're going around, whereas surrounding the entire cell is just a single line. So this is the cytoplasmic membrane, as we know. And the cytoplasmic membrane, again, as, as we know, uh, encases or contains the cell itself and separates extracellular from intracellular compartments, anatomical compartments, certainly fluid compartments. There's extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid that become very important. Obviously, the endocrine system, neuroendocrine system uh, included, is involved in controlling the balance between extracellular and intracellular fluid compartments, the ionic content, and, and a variety of things like that. So we will end up focusing a great deal uh, on intra and extracellular fluid compartments uh, as well for the methods of communications uh, between the endocrine cells, <clears throat> the cells of origin and the target cells, and how that signal is transduced across the cytoplasmic membrane. The nucleus has two of these membranes, so it's called the nuclear envelope, as we know. So the nuclear envelope is two of these uh, membranes, and in a moment we'll zoom in on uh, the cytoplasmic membrane to illustrate it, but we remember that it is a lipid bilayer. So this is a, a doublet of lipid bilayer membranes forming the nuclear envelope. So this means that there's an anatomical subcompartmentalization of this uh, junction between the intranuclear and extranuclear or cytoplasmic spaces, and it indeed is a very important area. It's not just this uh, void where nothing happens. We don't know a lot about what happens there, but we do know that there is uh, a lot that does happen uh, in this um, uh, interleaflet compartment, uh, if you allow me to call it that. And then we know that these are the nuclear pores. And what's the significance of the nuclear pores? Any type of opening or portal is going to allow movement of molecules. Molecules will move out of the nucleus and molecules will move into the nucleus. <clears throat> Inside the nucleus, what are the major things that we find there? There's the chromosomes with the DNA. 
and we'll zoom in on uh, the DNA in a, in a while and kind of uh, review it a bit. I can't draw a double helix too well, but we'll, we'll try to remind ourselves uh, of that. What else is located in the nucleus associated with the DNA? General biological macromolecule would be proteins, right? So a variety of proteins are present here. Are proteins synthesized in the nucleus? No, we know that they're synthesized in the cytoplasm under the direction of the nucleus. I'm not uh, suspecting that you don't uh, have that in mind. <clears throat> but this uh, brings us to the point that the proteins... Just put an asterisk on these, saying these are proteins that have permission to access the nucleus, so they're synthesized in the uh, cytoplasm and must move through a pore, nuclear pore, to gain access to the nucleus. Now that may not be true for all of the proteins that are there. We know that during cellular mitosis, the nuclear envelope disappears and a lot of the proteins, the histones, and a lot of other associated proteins uh, interact with the DNA, bind the DNA, and you know, twist it and all that stuff, <coughs> um, and very likely stay there for a long, long period of time and may not be uh, replaced. I'm not sure what the turnover of histone proteins are uh, in a cell. We know that uh, not every piece of DNA in this cell, if we think that it's a think of it as a neuron of the neuroendocrine system, uh, is used to ultimately to produce protein. Not all the genes are expressed. So some of the DNA is wrapped up very tightly and unavailable for gene transcription uh, for the lifetime of that cell. So we have to ask ourselves, are those proteins uh, there forever and they never have to be replaced? We don't know. I don't know anyway. I don't know that much detail about the, the histone proteins. But I do bring it up because a big part of what we discuss in this class is the life cycle of a biological macromolecule. We, it's essential to think of that when we talk about any type of biological signaling mechanism that's dependent upon a chemical. If the chemical stayed around forever, you wouldn't have a signaling system. It's always there, always there. My hand stays here all the time. There's no changing information, so you don't realize anything's happening. It's only when it appears and, uh, and disappears that uh, we uh, can realize that something is happening. So we all know that chemical molecules that are carrying a signal uh, are produced. They're sent to a target. When the target receives them, it realizes that something has changed, responds to that, and then that signal goes away, and it knows that this, the, the change is not essential anymore. That's the, the key molecular aspect of homeostasis as we understand it. So we'll zoom in on DNA and its proteins and, and that in a while uh, and uh, focus on it a bit more. What we do know is that uh, there's something else uh, in the nucleus that has at least the N and the A, but not the D. And of course, that's RNA. And RNA, uh, especially the messenger RNA that we'll focus on, is a key uh, molecule that exits the nucleus. Of course, uh, ribosomes uh, are assembled somewhere and are made up of ribosomal RNA uh, and the ribosomal proteins. So we know that ribosomal RNA uh, is exiting the, the nucleus as well. And what structure is associated with the production of ribosomal RNA? That would be the, the nucleolus. So usually there's a rib, big dense thing in here called the nucleolus. I'm not going to label it, but uh, you know what it is. Then scattered throughout when we're looking at a nucleus, we see areas of dark substance. There's one other thing that we didn't mention in here, and that, of course, is the nucleoplasm. Let's not forget the fluid component of this. It's not all dry proteins and dehydrated DNA. It's all hydrated and it's in an aqueous solution just as is the cytoplasm. So there's the nucleoplasm. 
uh, got to carry in the uh, nucleic acids to repair DNA if we're going to be doing that. Certainly the uh, ribonucleic acids have to be uh, carried in for the assembly of uh, RNAs. Uh, so there has to be a fluid phase, an aqueous phase, to get things uh, in and out. So other than the uh, nucleoplasm, uh, there is the chromatin, as we know, that represents the DNA associated with the proteins, in essence. So there's two types of chromatin. There's euchromatin, and heterochromatin. And the heterochromatin is the darker, and the euchromatin is the lighter color. Whether you're looking at a, a nice high resolution light micrograph or definitely an electron micrograph. So if heterochromatin is darker, do you think it's associated and compacted tightly with proteins? Why do I always ask a question that has the answer in it? Right? So heterochromatin is basically inactive DNA, right? It's not actively transcribed. So in a sense, that's the silent DNA in a cell. And then euchromatin is lighter, meaning that it's, it's uncoiled and it's stretched out and the DNA is available uh, for access by the appropriate proteins to uh, transcribe the DNA into the RNA. So the concept that I'm building on here as we're introducing the idea of the the DNA gene and gene expression is differential gene expression. And this differential gene expression will be the focus of the lecture, uh, the next lecture. What I want to do now is just quickly in the next uh, four or five minutes uh, is to fill in the rest of the subcellular organelles. We obviously have talked about the nucleus that contains the DNA, the encoded information uh, that is transcribed into the ribonucleic acid, uh, slightly uh, different version of that encoded message as we know. There's a lot that happens between reading the DNA and having the messenger RNA ready to be shipped out uh, to the, uh, the cytoplasm. Uh, I used to call it uh, post-transcriptional processing and have been corrected by cell and molecular biologists uh, th to refer to that as RNA processing. We will discuss that as well. When the messenger RNA enters uh, the cytoplasm, uh, it, can have, uh, it has one molecular target, which is what? What subcellular organelle does it target? Not like it goes hunting it down, but anyway, the one that it can interact with, of course, is the ribosome. <clears throat> so we find ribosomes structurally uh, in or in subcompartmental, uh, two different types of subcompartmental uh, areas within cells. They can be free ribosomes or as we know, they can be intricately associated with a reticular network of tubules and saccules called the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER, when the ER is associated with uh, ribosomes. And these used to be called fixed ribosomes, but they are not fixed ribosomes. There are ribosomes that are clustered in a close proximity to uh, portions of endoplasmic reticulum. When we find these uh, ER with the uh, closely associated ribosomes, it of course is called rough ER, or for short, the RER. <clears throat> so 
So we know that uh, there's one type of protein produced at the free ribosomes called the housekeeping proteins, like the enzymes for the glycolytic pathway that are in the cytoplasm. Some of the proteins uh, that uh, uh, come from nuclear DNA uh, genes and end up in mitochondria. So there's a, a wide variety of housekeeping proteins uh, other than the ones that end up going into the ER as they are synthesized. So as the messenger RNA would interact with a ribosome close to a, an ER strand, it'll interact and bind to the uh, interact with and bind to the ER membrane and then the protein as we know ends up being pushed into the endoplasmic reticulum as it is uh, produced or this is the process of translation as we know. We'll see all this again um, and I know it, hopefully it's a very familiar review for you. So these proteins get shuttled to a point where these uh, endoplasmic reticulum membrane buds off, goes to the Golgi apparatus as we know and quite often um, these will end up being secreted by the cell or the proteins will be inserted into the membranes and as we get this secretion process, exocytosis, the membrane proteins end up in the, uh, the membrane of the cell. So these little proteins would be in the membrane here as it's going along all through here. Other uh, of these vesicles will become lysosomes, so there's degradative and corrosive enzymes that we know about, peroxidases and things like that. Uh, I always include peroxidases, but uh, it's actually more complex. Peroxidases are produced by free ribosomes or in the cytoplasm become incorporated into uh, lysosomes when they're needed. So we are generalizing with this uh, generic cell. And I'll stop there, and that's a pretty good introduction uh, to how protein is uh, produced within a cell and what are the different basic categories of proteins uh, and where are they produced and where do they end up. So we'll begin the next lecture focusing on the, the cell membrane, different types of proteins in it, uh, and we'll uh, then shift over to differential gene expression. Thank you for your time and attention.